Good evening and welcome to our service tonight. Uh, during this Lenten season, we have been following Jesus as he takes his final steps to the cross. Uh, tonight we follow him as he stops in the upper room of the Passover lamb celebrating his last Passover with his disciples. Uh, we'll begin by singing our first hymn. has gone astray. We have wandered from your word, and we have each turned to our own way. Instead of following you, we have walked in the counsel of the wicked. Forgive us for every wrong turn and every selfish way, for all those times and ways that we have not followed in your steps. Forgive us, dear Jesus. Yet you were born in our place to live and die for us. You walk the dusty roads of this earth to live a perfect life. Your final steps took you to the cross. There you lay down your life as a perfect sacrifice for all our sins. How can we ever thank you for your love? Now we pray that you would give us the strength to walk in your light and your love. You have suffered for us, leading us an example, that we should follow in your steps. Help us to do this, O oh Lord.
tonight is Psalm 116. We'll hear the refrain, we'll sing the refrain, and we'll read responsibly. his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. For you, O Lord, have delivered me from death. My eyes and tears, my feet from stumbling. That I may walk before the Lord. salvation. and might through the resurrection of your son you have freed us from the anguish of guilt and the bonds of death be what be with us on our pilgrimage and help us glorify you in the presence of all your people through jesus christ our lord amen, amen. this time the choir will sing for us just as i am
In our scripture lesson, our passion reading this evening, we see Jesus in the upper room with his disciples and then in the Garden of Gethsemane, Mark chapter 14, we begin with verse 18. While they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, Amen, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and said to him one by one, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread with me in the dish. Indeed, the Son of Man is going to go just as it has been written about him. But woe to that man to whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. When he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them. They all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is poured out for many. Amen, I tell you, I will certainly not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. After they sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even if all fall away, I will not. <coughs> Jesus said to him, Amen, I tell you, today, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying emphatically, Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And they all said the same thing. They went to a place called Gethsemane. Jesus told his disciples, sit here while I pray. And then he took Peter, James, and John along with him and began to be troubled and distressed. He said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow, even to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch. Going forward a little, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He also said, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup away from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. When he returned to the disciples, he found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Were you not strong enough to keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed, saying the same thing. When he returned, he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. He did not, they did not know what they should answer him. He returned a third time and said to them, Are you going to continue sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us go. Look, my betrayer is near. And just then, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. A crowd was with him, armed with swords and clubs. They were from the chief priests, the experts of the law, and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal, saying, The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. He went right to Jesus and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. They laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood nearby drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Jesus responded by saying to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to capture me as you would a criminal? Day after day I was with you teaching in the temple courts and you did not arrest me, but this happened so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. And then the disciples all left and fled. This is our gospel lesson. Let's read the response together. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. We'll sing our next hymn.
grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus. Amen. Word of God we look at tonight is from Mark 14. We begin reading with verse 12 to verse 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, his disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Whenever he enters, or wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, Where is my guest room, or I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. His disciples left and went into the city and found things just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he arrived with the twelve. This is the word of God. May be seated. Dear friends in Christ, it's called the cenacle, which is a, a Latin word which means dining room. And so this, this cenacle, this dining room, is a, a room, an upper room in Jerusalem, built on Mount Zion, which I'm told is on the western hills of Jerusalem. And the claim is that this cenacle, this dining room, is the upper room where Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples. It's also the claim that this building in which this upper room is part of is built on the ancient site of the tomb of David. So, is this room, is this cenacle really the room where Jesus celebrated the Last Supper. Not likely. The architecture of that room does not fit with the rooms at the time of Jesus. And so archaeologists agree that this room, this building, was probably built about 1200 A.D. by the Crusaders, which would make it 800-some years old, over 800 years old. So very old, but not quite old enough to be the upper room. And yet it doesn't seem to matter to people because every year thousands upon thousands of Christian pilgrims go to that upper room. In fact, I'm told that the Pope even celebrated a Mass there a few years back. So, wherever that room was, lost to us most likely, it doesn't really matter where it was, but we know there was an upper room. We know that Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples in the upper room, part of Jesus' final steps to the cross. As I mentioned, we've been following his final steps all the way through this Lenten season, getting closer and closer, and so tonight we stop in this upper room where Jesus felt compelled to celebrate this Passover with his disciples because of everything he wanted to do there and everything he wanted to say there. And so we stop and follow Jesus to this. His final steps led us to this upper room. And we see that this upper room is the place where the disciples carefully make preparation for the Passover and that this upper room is where the Passover Lamb of God carefully prepared to die. And so the Passover... Uh, goes without saying, but maybe just a quick reminder that this was a sacred meal that the Jews celebrated every year as a remembrance of how God had led his people out of Egypt. And it was a pretty involved meal that involved a fair amount of preparations, and so we want to look at the preparations that went into celebrating this Passover meal. First of all, finding a room, which was not an easy thing because, as we mentioned Sunday, at the time of the Passover, Jews from all over the Mediterranean world came to Jerusalem, and we were told that there could be as many as two million Jews in the city for Passover. Most of them from out of town, all looking for a room where they could celebrate Passover, because according to Jewish tradition, you could not take your lamb outside the city walls. So everyone's looking for a room in the city and to find a room large enough for Jesus and his disciples to celebrate this Passover meal would have been a very hard thing. 
And yet not to Jesus, because he had it all worked out. Right? And so he told his disciples, go into the city. I'll read verse 13 again. He sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city, and there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Luke tells us that these two disciples were Peter and John. Jesus said, go into the city. You'll find a man carrying a jar of water. Still, uh, we scratch our head. Why didn't Jesus give them a little more? <clears throat> what about this man? What would he look like? What would his build be? What clothes would he be wearing? What would his facial features be? Would he have a beard or not? Of all the men carrying jars of water in the city of Jerusalem, how would they know the right one, the one to follow? Well, actually, there probably weren't very many because carrying jars of water was women's work. But Jesus saw this man already before he's carrying the jar of water. Jesus had seen him, knew he was going to be carrying the jar of water, told them, go follow him. We'll continue reading verses 14 and 15. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. Tell the owner, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may celebrate the Passover with my disciples? That kind of leads us to believe that this owner was a follower of Jesus who knew the teacher and would willingly give up his room for Jesus and his disciples. And so that's taken care of. Jesus, through his planning from eternity, has arranged for a room for his disciples. And so now there's preparations for Peter and John to make. It was a large room furnished and ready, so that probably saved them some time because Jewish law said that wherever you celebrate the Passover, that room had to be swept out completely. Every nook and cranny, not a speck of yeast could be in that room. And so if it was furnished and ready for them, it probably saved them that amount of work. But there's still the food prep, right? There's the lamb. The lamb had to be bought. It had to be inspected by the priests. It had to be sacrificed. It had to be butchered, and then it had to be slowly roasted. Beyond what we're used to, right? When we want a piece of meat, we go to the grocery store, we go to the meat case, we pick it out, and it's all neatly wrapped and over wrapped. We take it home, we pop it in the oven, just like that. Easy peasy. Not so easy peasy for these disciples. But this is what they did. And then there were other items on the menu, of course. There was often an appetizer, which was usually made from like parsley or onion or boiled potato dipped in salt water. There's the unleavened bread, which was just flat bread made out of just flour and water. There was oftentimes the dipping sauce for the flat bread, which is mentioned in the Bible. So a sauce to dip that bread in, which was usually uh, made from fruits or nuts and some kind of wine sauce. There's the bitter herbs, which a lot of times would be like horseradish or some kind of bitter greens. You know, I think of kale. You know, kale's kind of yucky, so... Something like that, which would remind them of their slavery in Egypt. And then there was the wine. Four glasses of wine drunk at different times during the Passover ceremony. That's a lot of wine, right? Unless it was watered down, which oftentimes it was. And so this Passover meal then, and all this food was actually scripted. There was like an order of worship as each course was presented. Then certain words were said or certain words were read. Um, when we were in Indiana, I had a chance to, to have a Seder meal, a Passover meal at a Lutheran church and, and go through all of this. Uh, at some point, the father would say this. And then the oldest son would say this. And then the youngest son would ask this. And then the father would say this. And all of it pointing back to how God saved them and also pointing ahead to the Messiah. A lot of psalms were read. Psalm 118 was read. And so this is all part of the preparation that was made for this Passover meal. All planned. And these plans would have failed if it were not for Jesus and his guidance and his direction in obtaining this room for them because this is what Jesus had planned from eternity to do. 
to have this meal with his disciples because there's things he wanted to say and things he wanted to do, as he said before. Jesus had this all planned out. Jesus has our life planned out too, right? Does it ever seem to us sometimes like our life is in shatters, like when you drop a plate or a glass and it's just pieces of glass everywhere and then how are you going to get that all back together if it is indeed possible to pick pieces of our life back up and, and get them all together again? Or sometimes the pieces of our life seem confusing to us as we look and say, how is this going to work or how, is, how are we going to get through that? Like when you want to make a thousand piece puzzle and you dump all the pieces out on the dining room table and you look at that and go, how is that all going to make this picture on the box? This is going to take forever. And so sometimes our life seems like that. But we want to remember who holds the pieces of our lives in his hand. The same Savior who saw that man carrying that jar of water even before it happened is the same Savior who, who holds our pieces in his hand. Nothing surprises him. And so he has our plans. They, they may not always be what we think they're going to be or what we want them to be, but they're what he knows them to be and what he knows to be best for us. So we can say, Jesus, take all these pieces and you hold them in your hand and you, you put them all together and you fix them all up for me because you know the best. And so here we are, Passover meal. It's all prepped, all ready to go. Jesus is there because he wants to be with his disciples as he prepares to die. And he wants to say things to them and he wants to give things to them. So think, think about in, in, in your life, what if you knew that you were going to die in a few hours? What would you say to your family? What would you say to the people at work, last minute instructions to give them as to how to carry on? What would you say to the one who's going to take over the farm after you're gone? What would you say to your financial planner? What would you say to your family and your loved ones? There's certain things that Jesus wanted to say to his disciples before he died. Now it's true that he would rise from the dead and he would have chances to talk to them again and give them instructions, but at this point, he had things he wanted to say. He wanted to give them warnings. He shows Judas, I know what you're going to do. Don't do it, is what he's saying to Judas. Repent, don't do this. Later on, we hear how he said to Peter, you're going to deny me three times. He says to all the disciples, you're going to run like, a sheep, like sheep are scattered from their shepherd. He gives them these warnings, and as we hear these warnings, we want to heed his warnings too, because he says to us, don't get so overconfident in our power in our strength, and think, I can do it all by myself. Let's not be like Peter who says, I will never do that. I would rather die before do that. Peter was trusting in himself. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, So let him who thinks he stands be careful that he does not fall. Jesus gave them warnings. He also gave them promises. He said, in a little while, you won't see me, and then you'll see me. And then you won't see me because I have to go to the Father, but I have to go to the Father so I can send you the Counselor, the Comforter who will be with you and strengthen you. And he says, you will have peace and you will live again just as I live, you will live. He gave them that promise. And he gave them the promise that I'm going to go and prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back, take you to be with me in my Father's house, so don't be troubled and don't be alarmed. As we hear those promises, you know they're promises to us too. Jesus promises us peace. Peace that the world cannot live. Peace that cannot give. Peace that comes from the Holy Spirit. As we are in his word and receive his sacrament, he gives us that peace. He promises us eternal life. Because he lives. He promises that he's getting a place ready for us. He's going to come and take us there. 
So we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be troubled. Because we have the Comforter with us. He gives us these promises. And he gave his disciples and all followers of his, his Holy Supper. Now why did he do that? Why did he give them that Holy Supper? Well, because he knew that, that we would need it. That same Savior who could look and see what Judas was going to do and what Peter was going to say and what the disciples were going to do and what the Pharisees were going to do and what Pilate was going to do, that same Savior looks in our world. He looks in our workplace. He sees in our house, in our kitchen, in our bedroom, in our garage. He sees everything we do. He hears every word we say. He knows every thought we think. And a lot of it does not look good, does it? It's sin. And he knows we need forgiveness. And so he gives us forgiveness because he gave his life on the cross. But he also knew that we would have doubts. He tells us in the Bible, I forgive you, I love you, but even though it's in the Bible, he knows that we would sometimes doubt it and we would, we would wonder, how can he still love me when I just keep living like this? How can he be with me? How can, how can, how can? And so he comes to us and gives us his own body and blood. The same body and blood he gave on the cross, he gives us in this bread and wine. And how eagerly we are to hear, how eager we are to hear the words as we kneel here or stand here, how eager we are to hear the words, take and eat. This is my body that I gave for you on the cross. Take and drink. This is the new covenant, my blood that was poured out for you for forgiveness. We long to have that weight of sin lifted off of us as we hear those words poured out for your forgiveness and receive his body and his blood. And so the Lord, in that upper room, wanted to give us that, that precious gift. And so here he is with his disciples giving them things, promising them things, preparing to die. And knowing that he's going to die because this is, these are his final steps. It's all planned out. And while Jesus is doing all of this inside this upper room, there are things happening outside that room. His opponent, the devil, is working all of his stuff in his hopes to defeat Jesus. He, the time is set, the place is set, the whole plan is in motion. He knows that he has the Pharisees on his side. He knows he has Judas in his back pocket. Pilate doesn't likely know yet what's going to happen to him, but his Friday is all worked out because the devil has all of these plans going, and he is in his mind saying, Jesus is a goner, he is going to die, and if I can just get him to crack under the pressure to say something wrong or do something wrong, then I have won. But the irony of ironies is that the devil's plan to kill Jesus is also Jesus' plan to die to defeat the devil. And so nothing surprises Jesus. Not death, not the devil, not our sin. Nothing can stop Jesus from his plans to be our Savior. And so his plans took him to this room to do all of this for us. And his plans then, tomorrow, take him to Calvary. And we follow his final steps as we go there to see him give his life for us. And in that, we see his amazing love and how he died for our sins. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. And we'll sing the hymn words.
Savior, thy dying love thou gavest me, nor should I aught withhold your Lord from thee. In love my soul would bow, my heart fulfill its vow. Some offering bring thee now, something for thee. Amen. And we pray. Our Savior Jesus, God provided us with a Passover lamb to save us from eternal death when he sent you into our world and sacrificed you on the cross for our sins. Work true repentance in our hearts, causing us to make sincere confession of our sins and to believe with joyful trust that he has forgiven us for your sake. May your body and blood given and shed for our sins be imparted to us here this evening in bread and wine in that supper which commemorates your death, ever nourishes our faith, cheers our hearts, and strengthens our will to live godly and upright lives. Precious Redeemer, may your face that once reflected the burden of our sins and the anguish of hell be ever turned toward us in love and tenderness. tenderness. Let no one in this Christian assembly who has known you as friend and Lord as well as Savior ever betray your love or deny knowing you. And may the dear blood once shed for us be for our sins the perfect cleansing power. Hear us to the glory of your name, Holy Redeemer. Amen. This time we will consider Christian questions in preparation for communion. Um, if you're following in the hymnal, they're on page 295 and 296. And I'll, re I'll do the questions, ask you to do the answers, So we'll do the answers together. Do you believe that you are a sinner? Yes, I believe that I am a sinner. How do you know this? I know this from the Ten Commandments, which I have not kept. Are you sorry for your sins? Yes, I am sorry that I have sinned against God. What have you deserved from God because of your sins? I deserve His wrath and displeasure, temporal death and eternal damnation. Are you convinced that you are saved? Yes, yes such is, is my confidence. confidence. How do you know this? I know this from the Holy Gospel and from the words of the Sacrament of Holy Communion. Which are those words? Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Do you believe, then, that the true body and blood of Christ are in the sacrament? Yes, I believe it. What moves you to believe this? I am moved to believe this by the words of Christ. Take and eat, this is my body. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. What does Christ want you to do when you eat his body and drink his blood in the Lord's Supper? Christ wants you to remember and proclaim his death and the pouring out of his blood as he taught me. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Why does Christ want you to remember and proclaim his death? He wants me to do this so that I will. One, I learned to believe that no creature could make satisfaction for my sins, but only Christ, who is true God and man, could and did do that. Two, I learned to look with terror upon my sins and regard them as great indeed. Three, I find joy and comfort in Christ alone and believe that I have salvation through faith in him. What moved him to die and make a complete payment for your sins? He was moved to do this by his great love for his Father and for me and other sinners, as the scriptures teach. Finally, why do you desire to receive Holy Communion? I desire to do this so that I learn to believe that Christ, out of great love, died for my sins, and that I also learn from him to love God and We'll continue with the service of Holy Communion.
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Super glad that you are here. Welcome. I want to thank the choir for singing for us um, about how the Lord is our our Lamb who forgives us when we come to Him. A um, couple things. So uh, different wafers tonight. There was no special symbolical meaning because it's Monday Thursday. They just sent us the wrong wafers. So so you have a box of them to use up, and then we'll get the regular ones back. So um, also our service tonight is 7:30. So we want it to be good and dark when we get, you know, into putting out candles. So 7.30 tomorrow night, um, remember that. And uh, then other than that, any birthdays or anniversaries I want to squeal on or confess to tonight? Better do it tonight because we're not doing it tomorrow. We're all going to just leave in silence. So this is your chance. No, no kids to squeal on people tonight, huh? All right, well, everyone have a good evening.